Okay, it's 10 o'clock, so I'm gonna get started. Um, we've got lots of people, this is great. Um, thanks for um, the idea to do this and for um, wanting to learn about snakes. Um, so this presentation that I give is usually for adults. So I changed the contents a little bit and it's been kind of fun to do that because I'm learning too that um, kids ask very different questions than adults do about snakes. And in a lot of ways, it's a lot more fun because in changing this presentation to be able to do that, I got to think about when I was a kid, um, probably a lot of the age of a lot of people watching this right now and why I liked snakes so much. And I think a lot of people when their kids really like snakes and then they stop at some point. So I got to think about all of that. So my name is Brian. I have to figure out how to make the slide go down and change. There we go. So I own a business here in town and I'm with these guys. Um, I do something called I'm a herpetologist. I catch snakes um, and I'm amateur one. There's people that go to school for this um, and are, are exceptional at it. And, um, you know, that's herpetology is the study of snakes and reptiles. It's a big, long, unfortunate word. So I study snakes that live here in the city and how they continue to live when they live, you know, lots of roads and bad things for snakes here, obviously. Um, and then we catch snakes at houses too. So me and my team, whenever someone gets a rattlesnake at their house, we go out there to that house and we catch them and, and talk to the people that live there so they don't feel so bad about that. And when I'm in my spare time, when I'm just hanging out, um, I go look for snakes. It's kind of something I do all the time. In fact, this picture over here, that is me with an Arizona black rattlesnake sitting down there. So all the time I'm around snakes and that's why I get to talk about them to you is because when you see them all the time, when it's something you see every day, it probably feels a lot different to me than it would be to you. And you might be very scared of snakes. I imagine a lot of, a lot of people, both the parents and teachers and kids um, alike are going to be, you know, probably don't feel that great about snakes. So I'm glad we're talking. So if you live in Arizona and you like animals or like snakes, this is a really great place to live. And the reason for that is that we have so many different types of snakes here. We have 15 species or 13, depending on which book you're reading at the time, both are kind of accurate. That's a little bit complicated, but we have lots of them here. And just in Phoenix alone, we have six different species that are here. And that's pretty incredible. So, you know, if you don't like snakes very much, then that probably doesn't sound very good. But if you're like me and really like them, then it's a really important thing and it's really nice. So we like that. And it's because there's so much diversity of habitat here. So everywhere you go, you know, if you've ever driven to Flagstaff or gone to another state, you see along the way so much different types of habitat, so many different types of cactus and rock formations and things like that that you go through. And snakes find a way to inhabit all of them and do it a little bit differently. So in each one of those situations, they look a little bit different and live a little bit different. And that's why you have so many different types that are here. So 15 species, you might read 13, you might mean more than that, they're all correct. But yeah, six of them here in Arizona. That means that, or in Phoenix rather. So in Phoenix alone, we have more snake rattlesnake species here than we do in any other city in the country. Uh, Tucson also has, is in there too. You know, we have Arizona black rattlesnakes are just on the outside of that. So you might have friends that say that you have Cameron from Texas and we have all these things. You know, nobody touches <laughs> the, these metro areas in, in uh, Arizona as far as how many rattlesnakes are here and how often people run into them. If you go hiking here, then you're going to see some rattlesnakes. So that's a really good, important part of what we're talking about today. This is not just about to talk about snakes that you might see so you can learn about snakes, but it's so that you can not be scared of them and know what to do if you see one so that you can be safe. And those things are very closely related. And we'll talk about that too. And a lot of that information comes from just kind of understanding what's real about what you might have heard and what isn't. And that's one of the things that's interesting to me is that when I talk to people about snakes, most of the things that they tell me happened or stories that they told me or things that they think are true are just not true. And you know, our, our uh, people that work in parks and adults are supposed to know, you know, we listen to what they say. So why has everybody got it so wrong? And that's a really interesting thing to me. So we're going to go into that a little bit. And I think when you're younger, 
you ask a lot of good questions. And I remember when I was, you know, in the second and third grade, snakes were not scary to me at all. And it wasn't because I had any, you know, special attention given to them necessarily. It's just you learn to be scared of them. So if you're not scared of snakes yet, you can learn to be scared of them or you can continue to not be. If you're already scared of snakes, it may have been something that you learned. So we'll talk about that here. So in Arizona, you hear about rattlesnakes a lot and it becomes a topic pretty often just because we have a lot of people here. And when you have a lot of people here, you have a lot of snakes here too, and then they run into them. So you end up with uh, a lot of snake stories. So, you know, if you go to school in a place where there are um, rattlesnakes, if you go hiking, it's Monday morning, people come back from the weekend and they went out and had fun and went camping. They're going to run into rattlesnakes out there and they come back with all these stories about them. And a lot of those interest, those stories about them are interesting because some of them didn't really happen in the same way that you might think that they, that they did. And a lot of them might be just plain made up. And there's a really interesting thing about why that happens. And most of the time we get those stories just because there are so many people and snakes here at the same time. So why is it such a dramatic thing? Why is it that when people see a snake that it tends to create these situations where um, it makes, makes weird stories and makes people that are scared of them, that kind of thing. Why does that happen so much? Why is it like when you see a deer outside or, you know, an owl or a bug, something like that, that's another type of snake out there or, or animal. Why do snakes get so much different attention? Why are we so terrified of them? And you might think already in your head, well, they're, they're bad. They, they hurt people. They, they bite things, right? But if you look at the numbers on it, if you look at which animals actually hurt a lot of people, you'd be surprised to learn about a lot of that. Actually deer are um, responsible for more injuries than, than snakes in a year. So this is the top reason or one of them about why we get so many silly snake stories out there and why we feel so um, scared of them or interested in it. And a lot of it is just the movies. So if anybody here has seen a movie that has a snake in it, that snake is always the bad guy, right? The rattlesnake never gets a chance to be the good guy. He's never a uh, part of the story that's helping something. It's always meant to be scary. It's a thing that a bad thing that happens uh, every time, right? So from the moment that you start watching TV or are exposed to even cartoons where snakes are a part of it, Snakes are always the bad guys. So as you grow up, you start to develop negative feelings about snakes so that when you actually see snakes out there, you know, for the first time, you know, some of you may have seen rattlesnakes already. A lot of you aren't going to see them until you're out hiking by yourself and, and going camping by yourself later on. But by the time that you see a snake out there, you've been filled with so much bad information about them that you really don't have a great chance to look at it as it really is. So Pay attention to that. Next time you see a snake in a cartoon or a movie, you know, you're going to see what I'm talking about. It, it is, they're always the bad guy for some reason. Another one is the news. So, you know, when there's a, a snake story in the news or on Facebook or, you know, somewhere out there, it's almost always a bad story. And it's not because the snake is bad. It's because they do funny things with the information. So one of these stories on here, uh, this one over here, in California, they run a, a story in the news every year. And it's exactly the same story. Uh, it's a drier year than it was last year. So more snakes are coming out and they're crawling around everywhere and everyone's scared of them. But it's the same number of snakes that they saw the last year, right? Except for the last couple of years when they had record rainfall. So now that same story changed to record rainfall makes snakes are everywhere. And here in Arizona, we have a version of that too. And it's that every watch in a month and a half, there's going to be your first stories out there. Someone's going to be hiking. And they're going to see a rattlesnake on a trail and they're going to tell somebody and it's going to go on Facebook and then everyone's going to freak out and say, hey, there's rattlesnakes all over the place. They're coming out early. What's happening? Why are they out early? They run that story every year and every year snakes are coming out at the same time. It's just an easy way to get clicks. It's an easy way to get attention because you pay attention to them. Another one is like this story right here where it was you know, really scary. Uh, a little girl was um, bitten by a baby rattlesnake. And she was playing in her backyard and was playing bare, barefoot and she stepped on uh, a baby Southern Pacific rattlesnake and it was very scary. It hurt a lot. She had to go to the hospital, but she was okay in the end. 
And there's a lot of lessons that you can learn from that about the safety around snakes and what venom is like and, and how to be cautious. There's a lot of good stories there. But what we need to know from that too is that um, the story itself is about a rattlesnake that stalked and attacked a little girl, right? That clearly didn't happen. So you can have the same information and spin it in a different way and come up with uh, an entirely different story that didn't really happen. And what happens is when that's out there, it perpetuates that. So that you, if you're scared of snakes and you read that, you start feeling like, Sorry, somebody was calling me 10,000 times. Um, you start to feel more scared of it. So it's an interesting thing what the news does with it. So again, if you're watching cartoons, you're watching movies, you never have a chance to really feel better about it. And here's where we get where you are hearing the most information about snakes. It is the people that you know. Okay. So we all have an uncle that likes to tell stories about the biggest fish he's ever caught, right? We all have friends that tell us stories and we know that some of those stories maybe aren't all that true. And that's how that, those are the, the stories that that person tends to kind of tell. Right. And those stories about rattlesnakes tend to be make up most of them. So let me show you a rattlesnake I got right here. So this guy right here is, let me see a prairie rattlesnake. It's not showing up too well. I have to hold up right in front of me. So this prairie rattlesnake, yeah, it is a venomous snake. And if you saw this guy out in the desert, it would rattle at you and it might scare you a lot, right? But what this snake is not gonna do, it's not gonna chase after you. It can't jump. It can't do any of those things. And basically what it's gonna wanna do is just try to scare you away and tell you to get out of here. That's, the, that's basically what it's gonna be doing, right? So, if somebody tells you a story that they saw a snake, if one of these fellas, if your uncle tells you a story that a rattlesnake chased them through the desert and bit their truck tire and popped it and, you know, all these things that these stories tend to be, you have to really question it a little bit. I mean, you don't want to, your uncle's not a liar. Right? So why does he feel like that happened? Why does he feel like the snake that he saw was such a dangerous thing? And all rattlesnake stories that he has are so dangerous. When somebody like myself, that I see rattlesnakes all the time. I mean, um, first thing I did this morning at six o'clock in the morning was open a bunch of rattlesnake cages so I could feed them, right? It's not, it looks very different to me. So why are people that are around snakes all the time, never chased by them, but people that see them sometimes get chased by them all the time. And it's because of the way that they see them. It's because of the way that they see those things. So all those things together, media and movies and cartoons and the news and the people that we know and the stories that they tell, they all are so negative about snakes that by the time that you are in high school, it's almost impossible to be able to tell the difference between all that stuff. And when you're young, you have an opportunity to really look at that and not become scared of it and to question all those things as you learn. them. So we're going to go through some of the myths and there are so many of them. I hear all kinds of silly things that people tell me. Um, Oh, there's other tech, other tech showing up. Hmm. Did not see that. Okay. So um, I'm just going to go through the top eight of them and people tell me all kinds of things, but these are ones that you may have heard before or think that it's actually um, pretty, um, you, know, you might think that they're true and you might rightfully think that they're true. These are things that you may have heard out there and they seem to make sense. Right, so I'm gonna close the chat and see. Maybe that helps find out. Okay, so the first one, rattlesnake attack. People ask me this all the time. Which of these snakes is the most dangerous rattlesnake? Do rattlesnakes attack you? Which one is the most aggressive? Which one's gonna jump at you? Which one's gonna chase you? That kind of stuff. And this is, these are the kind of pictures that you see of rattlesnakes all the time. Everything is always these really big um, <laughs> giant pictures of mean snakes and their mouths are hanging open and their fangs are hanging out. That's not really what they do, but this is the way we are kind of programmed to think about them. 
So when people ask me, what is the most dangerous rattlesnake? Which one is the most aggressive? Which one, you know, are they going to get you? Are they going to attack you? The answer is that none of them, none of them are going to attack you. It's not what they want to do, right? So when you see a rattlesnake out there, what it's trying to do is scare you away. Rattlesnakes are very scared of people. And that's the, one of the biggest reasons that you don't want to mess with them is because you're very big and a rattlesnake is very small, right? So imagine that you are hiking around out there and you're this little snake right here, right? See that snake that's hiding there, right? That's a rattlesnake. And then there's this guy, right? So imagine you're hiking out there and you're two inches tall. And then this other guy that's like five, six or so shows up and is poking sticks at you and throwing rocks at you and almost stepped on you. And, and your friend that you know just got eaten by a monster that's the same size. How are you gonna react? Are you gonna yell at that guy, that monster? You would, you would tell him to get away from you. You would try to do everything you do to, to, to stay alive and be scary. Let's say they had a weapon, you had a sharp stick, okay? And you had that monster. What would you do if that monster got too close? You would poke him with the stick, right? You try to get him away from you. That's all rattlesnakes are trying to do. They're not aggressive. They have no business trying to get you. They have no intention to do so, but they will defend themselves. If they feel like they're gonna get hurt, they will try to stop that. That's what all animals are gonna do, right? So if you put yourself in a situation like this, like this guy is where there's a rattlesnake that's sitting there and he's gonna play with it anyway and try to um, get some, <laughs> Uh, you know, for whatever reason that people do this for, right? He's probably trying to get attention, you know, and if you saw this video, it's really silly. And it's not, um, it's not a, a rare behavior. If you want to see what happens with, with people see rattlesnakes and see the biggest collection of dumb behavior that exists, you know, look it up on YouTube or something. You'll see people all around rattlesnakes doing stuff, except for the thing that they should be doing, which is just leaving them alone and walking away. Because that's what that snake is saying. When it stands up tall and it's rattling, it's not saying, I'm going to come get you. I'm going to attack you. It's saying, please leave me alone. I want to do what I was doing. I don't. We don't need to meet each other. We don't want to do this. That's it. So if you see a snake out there, leave them alone. But no snakes are aggressive. I've never had an aggressive snake. I see thousands of snakes. I've seen over, well over a thousand snakes this year. And zero of them were aggressive. All of them didn't want me there. So there's a big difference between that. So if you see a snake, just leave it alone, okay? So here's another myth, and you may have heard this one, and this, I think probably all your teachers may have heard this one too, is baby snakes. This is a mama rattlesnake with her baby rattlesnakes, okay? And the myth goes that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than adults because they don't know how to control their venom. And that is just not true at all. So couple things to consider here when you have a bunch of baby rattlesnakes here's some that we caught with the, the mom so you can see the size difference there big rattlesnakes have more venom than little rattlesnakes okay so when you have more venom more can be injected into you and then there's a potential there for more damage little rattlesnakes have little heads and little venom glands so they don't have as much venom so even if it were true that they didn't know yet how much venom to give, which when they looked at that, when scientists looked at that, they saw that that's not true at all. Rattlesnakes, whether they're big or small, they tend to know how much venom to give you, right? Big rattlesnakes have more venom. So even if it were true that baby rattlesnakes didn't know how to do anything with it and just gave you all the venom that they had, then it doesn't matter because they don't have as much venom as the adults do. Here's another myth. And a lot of people might believe this, okay? That you can tell how old a snake is from the, age, the size of its rattle. And you can't tell that at all, right? So here is a rattlesnake. And first, I'm going to say, don't hold rattlesnakes. I'm holding a rattlesnake in this video or in this picture because I have it restrained properly. I'm a professional. I'm doing this in a very particular way so that I can hold rattlesnakes safely. But this should not be seen as something saying, hey, hold rattlesnakes, okay? So this rattlesnake, you can see it's rattled really clearly there. And it's got a whole bunch of segments. One, two, three, four. And it's got a bunch. It's got more than 10. So does that mean that this snake is more, is it older than a snake that has fewer rattles? Is it, um, 
younger? Is it had a long life? Is it uh, still growing? Is it a baby? You know, is it 10,000 years old? You can't really tell. Okay. So the myth is that rattlesnakes, every time that they gain and get a new segment that they're a year old. So people look at that and go, okay, this snake has eight rattles. It's eight years old. And it's not true at all. So when you have a rattlesnake, let me get this other guy and I'll show you, I'll show you his tail. He's got a really long string of rattles on this guy. Let me see. There it is. This is not working. <laughs> oh, he's going to sit on it. Okay, there we go. Is that going to work? This is not working. I'm sorry. I have another rattle. We'll just use that instead. Here we go. So this is a rattle from a rattlesnake. Okay. It's not very big. So you look at this and go, okay, there's like seven segments on there. How old is that snake? If you think it's seven years old, that's not right. This snake is probably more than 30 years old. And the reason I have this rattle is this snake is fine. He's doing okay. He's not hurt. They just break off. It's really fragile stuff. Moths eat it. It gets wet and breaks off. It's made of the same stuff as your fingernails. Okay. So a snake living out there in the sun and getting wet and dry and dragging it over rocks and all kinds of stuff, it breaks off really easy. And every time that they shed their skin and they can shed their skin several times in a year. In fact, in the first month of life, they'll shed their skin two times. Every time that they shed their skin, they get a new segment. So sometimes you have really old snakes with really short rattles. Sometimes you have really young snakes with decently long rattles. Sometimes you have snakes that you see in a zoo that have crazy long rattles that you don't see in the wild. It's just because they're not exposed to the same elements. So while some people with a lot of experience can look at a rattle and kind of tell something about the age of the snake, you really can't look at the age of a, a rattlesnake rattle and say, I know exactly how that old that is. Okay. It's a fun myth, but it's not true. Here's another picture of that. Here's a prairie rattlesnake. This is an old prairie rattlesnake and it's got four rattle segments. The snake is not four years old. It is much older than that. It just breaks off a lot. So, so if anyone has some of these things, if you go to a park, like a natural park or something like that, um, you might see these or you get them like a gas station on the way to Tucson, right? You get these rattlesnake eggs and you can open them up and they make a sound and it scares your dad. Okay. So, and everybody in chat, please be cool. <laughs> There's probably some technical thing that I have to figure out for the next time about how to get the chat bubble to not appear over me, but it's okay. Go ahead and talk. Just be, be nice to each other. Um, so rattlesnakes don't lay eggs. Okay. This is a Arizona Ridge nose rattlesnake with three of her five newborn babies, okay? So they didn't hatch from eggs, they were born from her. So if you see eggs out there and you don't know what they are, they're definitely not rattlesnake eggs. It doesn't happen. And people will call me and they'll say, hey, I got snake eggs in my, rattlesnake eggs in my yard, please come help me. There's rattlesnake eggs everywhere. I can't, I can't, um, <laughs> I can't deal with this. And they're never rattlesnake eggs. So these are quail eggs, okay? And when you see these type of eggs in your yard, then you know for sure they're not rattlesnake eggs, they're quail eggs, they're bird eggs. But it's an interesting thing that happens in our brains. When people see these, they call me all the time and say, they help, there's rattlesnake eggs. And why, if they see eggs and they don't know what they are, do they skip over all the different types of birds out there and all the types of lizards and snakes that do eggs? And they're sure 100% that they're rattlesnake eggs. So that's another example that a lot of the fear of these snakes is kind of in your head. So if you feel scared of snakes, ask yourself why and see if you're doing something similar to that. So here's another myth. This little guy here is called a night snake. Okay. And he has a pointed tail. I'm going to figure out how to do this a little better. The pointed tail means that it's not a rattlesnake, even if the rest of it looks like a rattlesnake. No rattlesnakes in Arizona have a pointed tail. Even if they're born with a deformity, that means that they don't have a rattle or the rattle breaks completely off or someone cuts it off and that happens too. It's still rounded. If it has a pointed tail, a pointed tail is actually a pretty complex thing. You can't just, it's not the default position for not having a rattle. But these little night snakes, people squish them all the time because they think that they're baby rattlesnakes because they believe the myth that baby rattlesnakes don't get their rattles until they're older. 
So here's what a real baby rattlesnake tail looks like. And this is a brand new baby rattlesnake. You can see how young it is. Okay. And it has the first segment of rattle on it right there. I'm going to try something fancy here. There, look at that. <laughs> That's the first segment of rattle. And you can see that they're born with this first segment right there. And then after they shed their skin, they get this little hook on it. So at no point in life does a baby rattlesnake have no rattle. And if a rattle doesn't happen to it for some reason, like if it's a, you know, born that way or something interesting happens to it, it never means that there's, it's a pointed tail. Okay. So here's another one. If you're hiking or, you know, in your parents' first aid kit or the camping kit, or you see them at a store and you see this thing to where you, you're supposed to suck the venom out, you use a device and you pull it out, right? That doesn't work at all. If you have one of these devices, you want to throw them away. <laughs> um, they don't work. Um, and the reason for that, is the idea is that the venom, you will know, pull all the venom out and you'll be okay. And what it really does is it just wastes your time and doesn't get any venom out and can actually make it worse. When doctors look at what happened, when people tried to use these suction devices to get the venom out, it just made the bite worse. So don't use them. What you need to do is call 911. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Oh, bell icon. I'm looking for something. Thanks, Cassia. I'm trying to figure out where that is. Because <laughs> I don't get notifications on here, so. Okay. I'll just keep going. That's fine. Next time. All right. So, yeah, never do that. If you get one of these, throw it in the garbage. Doesn't work. Okay, so these are giant snakes. These are giant rattlesnakes, uh, or some people say, right? These are pictures that people email me all the time to snakes that they've hurt that they say are very big, that these snakes are, you know, 15 feet tall or 10 feet tall, <laughs> you know, all these different lengths, but they're really not. So like this little guy over here, he's, the news said he was 15 feet long. He's not. This one over here, someone said he was nine feet long. He's not. This one over here was 12 feet long. He's not. So what's happening? Why do these snakes look so big? Why are they getting so giant? And there's a lot of interesting things here that happen. But first is that when people send me these pictures, they always send me the same stuff. It's the same picture over and over again, but with different times to it. So what that tells me is that people just aren't really paying attention to it. And news outlets are not really doing the research that they need to, to see how big they are. In reality, these snakes are all probably in the four and a half to five foot range. Maybe this one over here is a little bit larger, maybe six feet long. And they look very big. So why is that happening? It's because of something called forced perspective. That's all it is. Is that when something is closer to you, it looks bigger. And when you're looking at a snake or you're looking at some kind of uh, very particular, um, you know, the topic is more interesting to you, then you might skip over that really obvious thing. You know, here's a water bottle. If I hold this water bottle right here in front of me, you don't think that I have a two foot tall water bottle because your brain is able to adjust it and you can see, right? But if it's a snake, you get so interested in it and looking at it and bugs do this too. You get so interested in it that you just can't pay attention to anything else. And it looks very big to you. If you've seen any of the Lord of the Rings movies, um, it's the same thing. They made the sets for this movie in a way that the little guys are further away than the big guys. So they look, that's all it is. So here's an interesting thing too. And this is complicated and you are probably too young to have formed any kind of opinion about what to do if you see a snake. But I know from other things, like when I talk to young people on TikTok, that there are a ton of people that still, you know, they just see it and they want to kill it right away. And that's a big, long topic. But the important thing to understand is that if you do that, you are really not making anything more safe. It feels like it might be doing that, but you're really not. 
So here's a good example of that, okay? It doesn't look like it. This is garbage and flies. So let's say you don't like flies. You keep your garbage on the front porch of your house and you don't, you don't wanna see flies anymore. You're sick of all these flies. So what do you do? You get a fly swatter out and you get rid of some of the flies. Job's done, I'm gonna go back inside and hang out. I don't have to have any more flies anymore, I swatted them. But what happens the next day? There's more flies, okay? And they just keep coming back. So if you tell somebody, hey, maybe you shouldn't swat the flies, maybe you should take the garbage out. Maybe you should get the garbage out of there and then you won't have any flies. Right. And snakes are pretty similar a lot of times at your house. If you have rattlesnakes that are visiting a house or visiting an area, it's not always because that they're just wandering through there. A lot of times it's because there's something at your yard or in your property or at that place that they really like. So when you're hiking, avoid those types of places. And if you're at your house, ask yourself if you see a rattlesnake there, why it's there. And that's a really important thing to understand. And it's hard because when people see snakes out there, see something like this, and it looks really scary that there's a rattlesnake and it's at your house, you could have stepped on it, that kind of thing. So when you see a situation like this though, if you get rid of the snake by whatever way you want to do it, you have to really look at why the snake is there and try to make it so that they don't come back. So you have to think one step above it. And a lot of times you see something like this and this feels really scary. You might think that this was, you know, it almost bit you because it rattled at you. Yeah, and this snake is sleeping but that's not really a near-death experience. It feels very scary, but if you can pull back from it and look at it for what it really is, there's a lot of things that you can do and none of them involve being scared of it. You know, these are the types of guys that get hurt <laughs> by snakes a lot and it's because they're doing dumb things. So, you know, a lot of times, especially when I'm talking to adults, especially older adults, it is very hard to tell them, hey, don't, play with rattlesnakes because they've been playing with them their whole life. But you are young enough to recognize that rattlesnakes are not a good vehicle for doing that. There's a lot of good ways to get attention and show that you're interesting and stuff like that. But playing with things that could hurt you really bad like this, then not a good thing. Which picture? My picture? Okay, so being safe around rattlesnakes is really not um, that hard. Hang on, I gotta read something here. Yeah, no, I probably have some some technical issues to deal with here. I'm sorry. We'll just kill, we'll plow through it and then I'll learn for the next time. So. Staying safe around rattlesnakes is easier than you think. It's not this big long list of things that you need to do and don't. So I broke it down into three different things, right? There's only three. And I think there's four. <laughs> so the first one is to just leave them alone. It's super easy to do that. If you see a rattlesnake and it rattled at you, if you see a snake in its coil on the trail, if you see one in your backyard or see something, the easiest thing to do that will remove you from all danger from it, 100%. If there's a snake that's over there, and you're over here, leave it alone and it can't hurt you. It is 100% true. There's no circumstance where a rattlesnake is going to be over there and see you and then come and get you. And even if that were true, even if it were true, they're not very fast. You can just, you can leave, you can go. So don't play with snakes. There's something about them that seems very interesting to us that makes it so that when we see something like that, we want to play with it. But just don't and you'll be safe. Okay. The other one, I'm going to get somebody to help me with this one, is don't touch them. If you don't know what a snake is, don't touch it. Don't mess with it. And we get a lot of emails from people that say, what is this? They're holding it or they just killed it or something. They play with it first or mess with it first and then they try to figure out what it is. And that's not a good situation. So I have this guy right here. And this is why, to explain why the thing doesn't just say never touch snakes. Because wouldn't that be easier or is it to say just never touch snakes instead of don't touch snakes unless you really know what they are? This is an Arizona mountain king snake. Okay. He's totally harmless. 
superficially, he might look a little bit like a coral snake just because he has some bands on him, right? But he is not harmful at all. When I was pretty young, you know, maybe the first grade or so, I don't remember exactly when it was. I think he pooped on me, but I saw one of these at a nature center in Oregon and they let me hold it. And when I was a kid, I used to catch garter snakes all the time. And I knew for a fact that they were not venomous because I got books about them and I learned about them. Okay. And the reason I remember this snake when I was a kid is that it was just so cool to me that it kind of changed my life in some ways. And I was really interested in them and never lost it. And that's probably the part of the reason that I'm do this for a job now is because of this snake. So if you want to avoid being scared of them and you want to know about them and maybe care about whether they still exist on the planet in the future, then touching snakes and having pet snakes and knowing about them is not really a bad thing. So that's why I would say on here, you know, never touch snakes unless you know 100% what they are. But if you're with you and you know sure what it is, you know 100% that it's not a rattlesnake or if you have a pet snake and you've read some books, it might be okay. Another one, a big one. If you're hiking or you're home or you live in a place where there are snakes out there, just watch where you step. Don't put your hands any place that you can't see. You know, here's a snake that was at somebody's house. And, you know, what would normally happen if someone just walked right past this or put their foot right next to it, the snake probably would not bite them. They would just walk past it. But accidents like that do happen. And a lot of those accidents, when those accidents happen, it's because somebody reached into a dark hole or something where there were some snakes and the snake got scared and bit them or they stepped on the snake. So go at night or when you're out at night, use a flashlight and you're, you know, going out to take the garbage out or something, always put shoes on. And just don't do one, make sure you always pay attention to where you're at. You know, I just moved into a house where there's lots of rattlesnakes around there. First thing I did was I got flashlights and I put them next to every door. So nobody in the house has any excuse to go outside without a flashlight and shoes. So just pay attention to where you're at. It's easy. Another one is to keep learning. So you don't have to love snakes. That's not the point of this. I'm not asking anybody, you know, whether you like snakes or not to like them. I know that's a big thing. I'm, I'm honestly, I don't really like horses very much. Like, you know, every time I've met a horse, it's wasn't very cool to me. And I just, I just, I just don't like horses. And I know it, it makes people mad that I don't like horses. So I understand not liking animals. Okay. But, you know, I'm not going to shoot at horses. I'm not going to go out of my way to, I'm not going to go to like Arizona horse lovers, Facebook page and say, Hey, I hate horses. Don't be that way, right? So you don't have to love snakes, but the more that you know about them can keep you more safe. So if you feel scared about snakes, if you feel uncomfortable that they are in an area that might be, or if you're going to be going camping or hiking with your parents and you feel anxious about that, it starts to make you scared. The best way to deal with that is to learn about them because the more you learn about things, the less scary they become. When I was a kid, I used to be really scared of flying every time I thought about going on an airplane. Even when I was in my early 20s, I was still really nervous about flying. And the way I handled that was I did a lot of reading and research to figure out how safe it is and how turbulence, when it starts shaking when you're flying, is, doesn't really crash planes and all that. It's all in my head. So the more you learn about snakes, the less you're going to be scared of them. And it's important because if you do see a snake out there and it rattles at you, if you are very informed, if you know more about snakes and about what to expect and all that, it's going to feel differently to you. You're not going to be as scared of that situation. And that's going to prevent you from doing dumb stuff. Like when people poke them with sticks and play with them. Okay. So I got a ton of really good questions. Some of them I'm not going to include in here because they were answered in other parts of the presentation, but uh, yeah, we'll roll through these. That's probably about halfway through here. So the first question is how big can snakes grow? Uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, the biggest snakes are, you know, probably in the, you know, they're 20 plus feet, but rattlesnakes here, they don't get that big. Okay. And you might get pictures of them that, that say that they do, right? Like you get these, like earlier we we're saying those giant snakes, but snakes really don't get that big. Big rattlesnakes in Arizona are about four and a half feet. 
a really monster rattlesnake that you see out there. Maybe, you know, one in 10,000 snakes once in a lifetime might be five feet or five and a half feet. But there are no six foot rattlesnakes here. There are no eight foot or 10 foot rattlesnakes. And people will say that, um, all right, be cool in the chat. I can't figure out how to turn it off. Um, that they get really big, but they really don't. And a lot of that is just because we're not very good at telling the size of things. If you were to look at your door right now, can you guess exactly how many inches it is? It's because we're not very good at it, right? So a big snake here, like this one on this side, that snake is about four and a half feet long. It's a very, very big snake. This other one over here, a prairie rattlesnake, it's a newborn, it's about eight inches long. So the answer is that how big rattlesnakes can get here, about four feet. If someone says that they saw an eight foot rattlesnake, they're not lying, but what they're saying is not, I saw an exactly eight foot long rattlesnake. What they're saying is I saw a big rattlesnake and I don't really know how to measure that big, but I want to tell you that it's big. So that's what they're saying when they do that. Okay. Another question, do rattlesnakes hibernate? Yes, they do. And they're doing it right now. Some people will yell at you and say, no, they're brumating. Um, those people need to lighten up because it doesn't really mean that many, it doesn't, it's not that different. Yeah, they rattle, they, they hibernate. And all it means is that when it's cold, they go and hide because they want to not be cold. If it rains or there's some particular things that happen, they can come out and get a drink and, and um, they might show up on the surface. So if someone sees a rattlesnake on the surface in January, it doesn't mean the rattlesnakes woke up early. And it doesn't mean that they're not hibernating. It means that they are, but that snake had some reason to come out. It's not going to go cruising around. It's not going to go hunting. It's not going to do things like that. Okay. How many eggs do snakes lay? So lots of snakes lay eggs, but as we learn, rattlesnakes do not do that, okay? And these right here are newborn baby banded rock rattlesnakes. They're like that long, they're little tiny guys. And I gotta say to everybody uh, in the chat, please be okay. There's actually on the presenter side of this, there's no way for me to turn off the overlay. I think if you don't wanna see the bubbles, I think you as the viewers, can turn that off so you don't get the notifications, but I can't do it on this side from, from what I can see. So, but please everybody be nice. Um, so these little baby rattlesnakes are very small. They are born, their mother is actually tucked into a crack up here. So their mom is with them and their mom stays with them for a little while and then they go. So how many babies do they have? So now that we know that they don't lay eggs, big rattlesnakes have more babies than little ones. So in our facility, our big Western Diamondback rattlesnake that we have, she has 10 or 15 babies at a time. The little rattlesnakes that we have are speckled rattlesnakes and, and things like that. They only have four or five babies. It's just however many rattlesnakes you can get in here, then you can get. What does it eat? It eats mice, it eats rodents. Some of them eat birds. Some of them, when they're babies, eat invertebrates. They'll eat all kinds of stuff and they'll eat big things. So what's the biggest animal a snake can eat? Here is a black-tailed rattlesnake eating a big squirrel. So however big around a snake is, a snake can eat something that's maybe a little bit bigger than that. And they can sometimes eat things that are a lot bigger than that, but it gets to be more dangerous for them to have something that's too big, okay? So what makes a snake rattle? And my snakes that I have here, they rattle when they're in our snake building, okay? And it's because they stop worrying about me too much. And that's kind of why they're being cool here. But when a rattlesnake rattles, like you can see here, where's my rattle? It's right here. This actually works. You probably hear it. It's not very good. So it's because they have loosely interlocking segments. And those segments, when they move against each other, see? Zoom is confused. This is a good trial run for this, huh? <laughs> it rattles. So as it breaks off, it's just, there's nothing inside of it. It just rattles against itself. Okay. Here's another question. How do snakes get a good night's sleep? And I think this came because snakes don't have eyelids. Their eyes are always, hey, no, it'd be cool. Everybody be cool, please. Um, they don't have eyelids, so they can't close their eyes when they're gonna sleep. So how do they close their eyes and go to sleep? Okay. And just because they don't have eyelids doesn't mean they can't close their eyes. All closing your eyes does is it keeps 
your light from not <laughs> getting in your eyes. So they have vertical pupils. So when they want it to be open and get lots of light, they make it round. And when it wants to be dark, they close it. So this snake, it's letting in some light, but it's trying to not get a lot of it in there. So they can close their eyes. It just looks a lot different. And snakes don't have eyelids. So you might think, how do they get sand and all kinds of stuff in there? How do they keep it clean? And they have actually, it's kind of like wearing sunglasses. They have a little bubble that goes over the top of it. It's clear and they shed it off when they shed their skin. You can see it. So there's actually not getting dirt in their eyes. It just, it's covered. How many different species of rattlesnakes are there? Many. <laughs> so it depends on which books you're reading again. If you're more on the conservative side, that number is you know a little bit less than 40, a little fewer than 40. If you're looking at on the little more progressive side um, where there's a lot of splitting of species and that kind of thing, then there's lots, there's in the 50 or 60 plus of them. So in Arizona, we have 13 or 15, we have quite a few of them. So we have lots of rattlesnakes and a lot of people are surprised to learn that we even have multiple types at all. And they'll just say, well, rattlesnake is a species. Well, when you have all these different types, these are not different subspecies or breeds anything like that, they are fully different species of rattlesnakes. So we have lots of them. Where do you find them in the wild? So this is a speckled rattlesnake that I found and they hang out in places that they can get out of the sun and they can get food and they can eat. It's kind of like the way that you live where you live and you have a territory, right? You're territorial in the same way that snakes are. You have a favorite place to eat dinner. You have a favorite place to watch TV. You have a favorite place to go hang out outside. That's your territory. And if your favorite restaurant closed down, you wouldn't starve to death. You would just find another favorite restaurant. And that's what rattlesnakes do. So what I do when I'm looking for them in the wild is I look for places that have useful opportunities for them. And most of the time that is near water. That's near where there's lots of good places they can get out, out of the sun, under big boulders and rocks, that kind of thing. And if it's at a house or a park, a lot of times that means that it's, those are situations that we come up with artificially. So if you have a little pond back there, then yeah, snakes are gonna come and hang out there. Are they all venomous? Yes, all rattlesnakes are venomous. All rattlesnakes are pit vipers and they can envenomate their prey. There are some rattlesnakes in captivity that people have removed their fangs and done stuff like that to where they're no longer able to inject venom. Um, it's not great to do that. So if you see a rattlesnake out there and it has a rattle on its tail, 100% venomous, okay. So what do you do if you find yourself upon a rattlesnake den? If you live in Arizona, especially the low parts of Arizona, seeing an actual rattlesnake den is not something you can do a whole lot of. Though in the summer, if you're hiking around, especially in the morning, it's possible to see multiple rattlesnakes out there together. And what to do when you see a rattlesnake den is not a, that different of a question um, from when you see just one rattlesnake. It is just leave it alone and back up. If you hear a rattlesnake and it's rattling at you and you don't know where it's coming from, just go back the way you came and you don't need to go slow. If you have a whole bunch of them around you, you know, you've been walking and suddenly there's a whole bunch of rattlesnakes around you and you're at a den, it's the same thing. Just back up. Just take a few steps back. You don't have to run. Just back up and get, you know, they're saying, hey, go away. So just listen to them, go away. Um, the biggest rattlesnake you're gonna come in contact here in Arizona, um, especially down near Phoenix and Tucson, it's it's not that many. There might be five five snakes there. Most of the time they'll den by themselves or in very small groups. If you're up near Flagstaff or something like that, then you can um, see something that are a little bit different. Hang on a second. Okay, Aaron has exited suddenly. So if you see a bunch of snakes, just don't worry about it too much. It's not something that you need to deal with um, too much, but if you do see one, just back off, it's easy. So this is an interesting one too. Is it true that if the head is cut off, it can still bite you? And I hear this from mostly like old cowboys. Like if you, 
if you cut its head off, you got to dig a tunnel six feet into the ground and throw it down there and then put rosemary on it and say some magic words and then they can't bite you. So rattlesnakes, if they are killed, can still bite you. They have nerves that can come out and, you know, they can still bite and they can envenomate after they're dead. So the action of, you know, if you're going to cut its head off, and how deep you need to bury it and all that stuff. The answer is don't cut its head off, right? It's, if you see a snake over there, just don't, just leave it alone. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about things like that. So yes, a dead snake can bite you. Yes, if you kill a snake and then hold it so you can cut its head off, it can still bite you. All of those actions are things that are gonna, that are gonna potentially hurt you and are not making you more safe. So yes, and don't do this. So if a snake uses its venom, does it get more? Right? Does it get it back? Is it slow? Um, does it take a long time? And it's kind of like spitting. How much do you need to spit before you don't have any more spit? It's kind of like that. So they always get more back. It can take a little while. But most of the time when we see our snakes and they bite something and they use a bunch of venom, they're able to bite again and do that too. So just because something has envenomated prey doesn't mean that it's safe to handle or anything like that. And it always, does it always use venom? No. So some rattlesnakes don't use their venom. Um, and it's not always, you know, they have some way to meter that themselves. Their, the heat pits that they have can help inform that. Uh, sometimes it's by accident. So you'll hear about dry bites where a rattlesnake has bitten somebody and there's no venom that went into them. Sometimes it just ended up on their pants or their boots or the snake got it out early or something like that. But if there is a rattlesnake and someone's bitten by it, don't try to go off of weird statistics. You'll hear people say, you know, 50% of snake bites are, are dry bites. None of that stuff is, is accurate. You know, there's no, no regional statistics that hold, hold true. So if you think you've been bitten by a rattlesnake, don't wait to see that something happens. The only person that should tell you that a snake bite was a dry bite is the doctor at the hospital. And how much venom does it inject? Lots of good venom questions here. And I, I don't know as much about, about venom as I probably should. Um, how much venom? They give you about the right amount. And that sounds like such a stupid answer to that question. But look at it this way. When you open a door, do you grab the door and fling it open as hard as you possibly can? Let's say you've never gone through this door before one time, okay? It's a new door. You've never gone through this door. Do you start out by just opening as fast as you can, as hard as you can, or do you, you know, give a little bit less? You're probably not going to open it exactly right, but you know about how much force it takes to open a door, and that's kind of the way that you do it, right? So they're kind of similar to that. Their heat pits, their eyes, the smell of it, it can tell them, okay, this rabbit is about this big. It needs about this much venom. So let's give it that much venom. And over time, they can learn and adjust the amount of venom that they use in those things. So it's a willful thing that they do. So they use just enough venom um, to do that. And if you were to inject it and you were to look at it, it might fill up like a you know, bottle cap or something like that. But it's not a ton. You don't get like a whole tremendous amount of it. If you are bitten, this is another one that seems complicated, but it is actually very easy. If you are bitten by a rattlesnake, you call 911. You don't wait to see what happens. You don't um, try to do anything yourself. You don't try to suck the venom out or do anything like that. Okay. You call 911, you go to the hospital. That's it. There's no external treatment for rattlesnake bites. You're not going to do anything that's going to make it feel better. And what do you do if you see a snake in the wild? I think we've covered that a lot, but just to show you this one, this is a snake that's in ambush. This is a Western Diamondback rattlesnake. It's actually kind of near a trail. And people had seen this snake, right? So um, what do you do if you see it? You don't do anything. You can take a picture of it. You can tell other people about it, but just leave it alone and you'll be totally fine. You know, I see wild snakes all the time. And my favorite thing to do is to take pictures of them when I see them. It's okay to do that. You don't have to get close to a rattlesnake to do that. If there's a snake and it's over there, you can take pictures of it and look at it. It's not going to come after you. You don't have to run away, but don't get closer to it. Don't play with it. You know, it's pretty easy. How many times in its life will it shed its skin? I actually have a shed skin here. This is not from a rattlesnake. This is from 
a Honduran milk snake that I keep as a pet. But rattlesnake sheds are pretty similar. And they will shed as often as they need to, and that might change depending on the health of the snake, how fast it's growing, how much water it gets, how young it is. So younger snakes tend to shed more often because they're growing. It's just like when you change clothes, right? You are still at an age where every year or so, you don't fit into the pants that you had the year before. Your shoe size is still growing, okay? So you need to change your clothes a lot more than you do when you're older. I'm 41 years old. My shoe size is the same every year. Um, my sh shirts, and I mean, they still change sizes year to year, but it's for different reasons than when you're 11. Um, yeah, they shed their skin whenever they're growing. And when you have snakes that are growing quickly, then they're going to shed more often. But most of the time they'll shed, even when they're really big and old, they'll shed a few uh, times a year. So we have a big rattlesnake. It's in its 30s and most likely. And it sheds probably two or three times a year is all. We have little baby rattlesnakes. They shed all the time. Um, we have one snake that he is sick. He has some liver problems and he's, um, he's shedding a skin all the time. Sheds it a lot. So he's not doing great, but they do it for a lot of different reasons. What actions can it take around the yard to minimize exposure to rattlesnakes? So this is a topic I usually talk about with uh, parents and older people, but the, the easy answer to that is just look at your yard. So in your backyard right now, you probably have, you know, there's that pile of junk on the side of the house and there's stuff in the front and you want you to tell your parents how to make it so that you don't see rattlesnakes here if you're really scared of having them in your house. The best thing to do is just clean up your yard and make sure the landscaping is in order. Like we were saying about where rattlesnakes like to live, they look for places that are useful to them, where they get food and they get places to hide and all that stuff. If your yard is really clean and there's not many places to hide and there's not many rodents there, there's nothing to eat there, they can't get a drink there, then they don't want to be there. They have no reason to be there. So, you know, it does, it's not always that simple. Sometimes we like those things. We like having swimming pools. We like having pretty bushes and flowers and stuff that snakes also like to hide in too. So there's a little bit of balance there. You know, it doesn't have to look um, like the surface of Mars. And I use the same picture for this one because it's the same answer for this one. Are there any home remedies to try a bite before going to a doctor? And there are not. And actually, I saw something that was in the news last year a lot that um, it was kind of troubling because they uh, it said that can you use Benadryl? to treat rattlesnake bites? And the answer is no, <laughs> it was complicated. Sometimes a doctor in the hospital, and I'm not a doctor, so take all this with a grain of salt, okay? Um, if you use, and it, like they might give you an antihistamine, like what Benadryl is in the hospital um, to help during some parts of that, but no, you can't take something and then feel better before you go to the hospital. It's an internal poisoning. It's like if you ate poison and then tried to put something on your skin. It's not going to matter. So if you are bitten by a rattlesnake, if you think you were bitten by a rattlesnake, go to the hospital. If you're in a place where you don't have any way to call for help or anything like that, get to a place that you can call for help or send somebody to call for help. That is the only treatment for rattlesnake bites. And one thing to really remember too, is if you are bitten by a rattlesnake, it's, it might be really scary and it's going to hurt, but you're going to be okay and you'll live. In the United States, we have very good treatment for rattlesnake bites, and that's not something that's going to kill you. It's just going to be a good story later. Why do snakes have forked tongues? This is a really good question. And I, you might be wondering why I have a picture of an ear here for this. It's more or less for the same reason that you have two ears. So when you hear a sound out there, you can tell where in 3D space that sound is coming from. And it's because your two ears can triangulate on that sound and tell you. It might be a little bit louder in this ear, so now you know that the sound is from over there. You can tell where it's at. Rattlesnakes can do the same thing with smell. So when they're smelling something and their tongue comes out and it, you know, there's two forks on the end of it, if it's a little bit stronger on this side, they know that maybe that prey is over here and they can figure out where it is. So when you smell something, you have two nostrils, but they kind of go into the same place. So you can't really tell which direction a snake can, uh, you know, where a smell is coming from, but snakes do and can't. So it's really important to them. 
This might be one of the last ones. Do I ever tag rattlesnakes so I can track them before I let them go? Yes, I do. So that's one of the reasons why I know what snakes do is that we um, do research in some of the city parks here and other areas, uh, not only looking for snakes all over the place, but um, you know, here in Phoenix, the thing that I look at is what snakes do when they live near and around people. So if you've gone hiking at Piestua Peak, if you've gone hiking at Reach 11, if you've gone hiking in a lot of different places, um, then you've probably seen snakes, if you've seen one there that, that I know that have pit tags in them. So when we're saying things about what snakes do and where they go and all that, a lot of that information comes from going and seeing snakes and seeing them over and over again so we can learn about them. So this is a picture of me with a Southwestern speckled rattlesnake and I'm about to stick a pit tag into it. You'll see that I am holding it, but I'm using something to restrain it and also I'm a professional. So again, just cause you see me doing something doesn't mean you should do it. And that's the last of the questions. I got a couple of other ones too in the chat while I was doing this. Um, I got four, so I'll answer them. How many snakes do you have? We got about 30 of them. Most of them are rattlesnakes and they're not pet snakes. They're things that we use for purposes like this. So, uh, we try to keep them, you know, there's a, a mental block that you put on pets where Crotalus scutulatus can really hurt you, but fluffy isn't in your head, right? So I don't name my pets or my snakes. I don't treat them like pets, anything like that. How big do prairie rattlesnakes get? Prairie rattlesnakes get to be about four feet long is a really big one. Most of them are a lot smaller. Um, do we milk the snake's venom? No, we don't. Um, we don't have any purpose for it snakes milk or venom comes out now in a professional setting in a lab setting. So there's really no need to do that. Uh, can you do a red racer? Yeah. Red racer is a snake here in town that are very common called a coach whip. So um, I usually don't use the word red racer because coach whips can also be black or brown or green. And there are a lot of other red snakes and any red snake tends to be called a red racer, even though they're all different species. I saw another a few here. Can rattlesnakes climb block fences? They can't. It cannot. You may see people that have claimed that they could do it. A rattlesnake cannot belly crawl up a block wall any more than, than I can. Okay. They can climb if they have lots of stuff to hang on to while they're doing it. Another question, how do you protect your dog from snakes? So the first one is to use a leash. When we asked people in polls that have had their dog bitten by a rattlesnake and veterinarians that treat it, we knew that there would be some difference between snakes that, uh, you know, dogs that are on leash and dogs that aren't, but I didn't know how much it would be. It's, it's for every single um, snake or every dog that is bitten on a trail that is on leash, there are nine dogs that are bitten that are off. Dogs tend to be bitten on the nose. They're not bitten on the belly or the feet. It happens sometimes, but not most of them. And that means that the dog saw the snake, the snake rattled, the dog went in to go play with the snake or whatever. And then, the owner, since they didn't have a leash, was not able to correct it. So you might think that your dog has really perfect recall. You know, don't test it. I know it's more fun for them to not have a leash, but it's also not fun to die from cytotoxin in your face. Either. So, you know, use a leash. Another thing you can do at your house is to get snake training. We don't do snake training, but there's lots of good companies out there. The one that we like is called Rattlesnake Ready. Um, they can teach your dog to fear snakes. It's really good. So they'll just avoid them. Do rattlesnakes jump? They do not. Um, they might strike so hard that they fall over. It might look like a jump or they kind of, you know, there's a little bit of stuff there, but they can't jump for the same reason. I can't punch so hard that I go flying through the air. The physics doesn't work that way. I think that's all the questions. Oh, wait, I just scrolled. There's a whole bunch. I'm sorry. So Vanessa is asking, when you care for the young, do they catch the food for them? And what do the snakes eat? No, the parents um, are just kind of there for, you know, they, they, there's some interaction there. They, there's some protection there, but it's not, um, it's not super interactive. They don't teach the babies how to, to eat. Normally the babies stay with the mother until they shed their skin and then they go out with their own and then they, they know how to do it already by instinct. Um, rattlesnakes, another one, do not spit venom. Um, they can, if you're struck at one, sometimes venom spills out, especially if it hits something else. You can get, I get venom on me occasionally when I'm working with one and it's struck and hit a branch or hit something and I get venom on me, but they don't open their mouth and spit venom. 
There are venomous snakes that do that. There are spitting cobras that can spit venom and the front of their fangs have a little hole in it. So when they squirt the venom out, it pressurizes it and it's like a squirt gun and it comes out. What temperature range do the snakes come out from hibernation? So they tend to come out when temperatures are stable. So in the springtime, you know, today is going to be like 72 degrees in Phoenix. So you might think, well, wow, that's warm enough. Snakes are going to come out. They don't care about it because it was 40 degrees last night. And that big swing in temperature means that it's not good to go anywhere. They wait until it's safe. So typically the thing that we look for is not just temperature, but timing. So in late February, early March, when the temperatures start getting into the 60s or upper 50s consistently for several days in a row, that means rattlesnakes are going to say, hey, it's springtime. Let's go eat. I'm hungry. Is it common to see a rattlesnake swim? Yeah, it's not something they do all the time, but you do see a lot of presentations. Uh, as far as reading while I was talking. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Um, you do see a lot of snakes swimming in YouTube videos. And a lot of times it looks like they're trying to like attack boats. They're not trying to attack boats. They're trying to get out of the water. They don't know what boats are. So you can see rattlesnakes swim. They can swim quite well. Um, it's not uncommon. So what causes the color pattern differences between snakes? Uh, camouflage. So when you see a snake out there and it has a particular pattern on there, that pattern is trying to make it either look like something or make it so it's not seen at all. So the different type of pattern, let me pull you this snake. Again, this is a speckled rattlesnake with this crazy looking white pattern on it. This is actually really good camouflage to it. Not here because it's on a black background, but this snake where it lives is on white granite. It's a mountain made of quartz. So it's all white rock. So when you're trying to figure out why that snake is white, if you saw where it comes from, then you can see exactly why it's that way. All these different snakes have different patterns that help them break up their pattern. And sometimes it's just so they're not snake shaped. And that's how they all do it. They all evolve differently. Can snakes eat other snakes? They do. There are some snakes like king snakes that eat snakes whenever they can that are primarily eat snakes. Okay. Um, when you see other types of snakes, they might eat them sometimes. Rattlesnakes tend to not eat other rattlesnakes. The exception being sidewinders that sometimes will eat other sidewinders, but it's, it's probably an accident. So rattlesnakes try not to. And the big reason for that too is it might be because rattlesnakes can also be hurt from other rattlesnakes venom. They're not immune to other rattlesnakes venom. They're not even immune to their own venom. A rattlesnake can accidentally bite itself and die. I've seen that happen. So it's a really interesting thing that happens there. So if you were to fight with another snake, to eat it, it's it's not good. You don't want to go try to eat something that can also eat you. Uh, why do they have scales? Uh, same reason you wear pants and a shirt. It's kind of it protects them from the environment. It's a way of um, keeping their skin tough and waterproof and things like that. They also have shapes on their skin that help them harvest moisture from the air so they can drink water. And can snakes' skins change color to adapt? So rattlesnakes. Um, they don't really change colors quickly. Some do, some don't. Okay. So like a speckled rattlesnake, that's white. It's not that a snake found that area and then it turned white. It's that over time through natural selection, snakes that tended to be lighter colored probably didn't get eaten by birds as often or were able to successfully find prey and, and ambush hunt better than the ones that weren't. So over time, the snakes that were whiter tend to turn into, they succeeded and had more babies. So it takes a long time. There are some rattlesnakes that change color though. So um, Arizona black rattlesnakes, for instance, they can change from a really light colored kind of lavender gray color to a pitch black color. And they can do it within an hour or two. There are some Arizona or um, some Western diamondbacks that can do that as well. And there are some other rattlesnakes that have varying degrees of changing color for a lot of different reasons. Does tagging a snake hurt the snake? It probably does. It probably doesn't feel that good. Um, what we do when we're doing that is we have a very sharp needle. It's one needle every time, so it's never used again. We take out the needle, the pit tag is in it already. We clean the area and I inject it and I get it over as quick as I can. And when that happens, usually the snake goes, <sighs> doesn't like it, okay. But 
you know, I prefer not to have to do that. There's a way to do it, but I feel that the work we're doing to understand that the way that the snakes live is justifying that momentary bit of stress for the snake. And keep in mind, living in the wild is tough. You know, it's not like, <laughs> it's not like us where you can go a whole year without maybe bleeding. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough out there and, you know, snakes are all you know, part of that. So injuries are not uncommon. They do get stuck by cactuses and things like that. So it's tough to be a snake. And I'll wrap it up by saying that, you know, this slide, I'm sitting in front of the words here. I'll move. There we go. Snakes are not mean. Okay. So regardless of how you feel about snakes, it's a good thing, especially while you're young, to look at how you feel about them and whether you're scared of them or not. And if you are scared of them, why are you scared of them? And really deep, dive deep into that because if you don't want to be scared of snakes later, if you're already scared of snakes and you don't want your kids to be scared of snakes, the best way to do that is to learn as much as you possibly can about them. Okay, so um, here is some more information. If you have questions that I haven't answered or 10 minutes from now, you come up with some other ones or as a classroom, you have a whole big list of questions that, um, that came up during the course of this, you can email those to me and I will answer them either in a video or um, I'll just respond to you, okay? Um, we're on TikTok as well. I uh, talk a lot about snakes on there. We have a Facebook page um, and of course our website. And then something that can help me out too is when you're out hiking and if you see a rattlesnake out there, use uh, your phone or whatever, get a picture of it and try to get coordinates, your GPS coordinates, or just pull up your map, like Apple Maps or Google Map and take a screenshot of it. And that, that might be enough of where it's at. And send it to me because sometimes when that happens, you're telling, you might have found something really cool. Okay, so that's it. Thank you so much. I know that there were some, some technical things that came up. I, I was trying some new stuff here. So I definitely have uh, some learning to do about how to use this platform. Um, but parents and teachers, if you could do me a favor when this is over to send me a message and give me some feedback because I mostly talk to adults talking to kids is kind of new for me. So I'm trying to learn how to do this better. So please give me some feedback that might make it better for me for next time. I uh, really appreciate everybody. Have a good day.